In 1990, a genius idea was brewing up in Satoshi Tachiri's mind. Like many kids, Tachiri loved catching insects during his childhood. He loved the idea of discovering new breeds of insects, the idea of exploring their habitat and seeing what they can do. Of course, in his mind it was probably way more exciting with all kinds of giant beasts with large claws and supernatural abilities. One day, he saw an accessory for Nintendo's incredibly popular handheld game system, the Game Boy. This accessory, called the Link Cable, made it possible for two or more players to communicate, competing with each other or trading items and other goods. Tajiri imagined two friends exploring a fast world, taming the creatures that live in it and battling and trading with each other. Fresh from the release of Quinty, Game Freak pitched a new project to Nintendo. It was called Capsule Monsters, or Capumon for short. It was an extremely ambitious project, one that was likely beyond Game Freak's capabilities. After all, Game Freak was still a small and inexperienced studio, and because of that, the executives who analyzed Tachiri's initial pitch weren't convinced. Well, except for one absolute lad who saw tremendous potential in it. Tachiri put the Capsule Monsters project on the back burner, and the team focused on other projects for the next few years. Some were projects directly connected to Nintendo, while others, such as Cherry Boy, were published by various companies, such as Sony. Huh, imagine that nowadays. As the years went by, Game Freak earned Nintendo's trust, and Tachiri's dream game was starting to take shape. It was no longer Capsule Monsters, but rather Pocket Monsters, or Pokémon for short. But despite the new name, Pocket Monsters inherited much of Capsule Monsters' DNA. It was still a game about the idea of people exploring a vast world, taming the creatures that live in it, and battling and trading with each other. Unfortunately, many of Game Freak's initial designs for the game's world and monsters has remained a mystery for over a two decades now, with only a trickle of these lost assets being drip-fed to us fans every once in a while. But maybe that's a story for another day, when perhaps some collector decides to release his prized prototype cards to the public, or maybe Game Freak themselves will show it to us one day. Regardless, after many years, on the 27th of February of 1996, Pokémon Red version and Green version were released in Japan. The pair of Game Boy titles was published by Nintendo, now confident in Game Freak's success. And Jesus docking Christ was it a success! Seriously, according to Wikipedia, these little bastards have sold 47 million copies in total. Of course, this number includes all four Generation 1 games, but it's still pretty friggin' impressive. The Pokémon franchise is big. Super big. Ridiculously big. It single-handedly launched Game Freak into levels of success that nobody could have ever predicted. Though there is one other company involved, even if people don't really talk about it much, because who cares about that nerd crap? Creatures Incorporated is a company established in 1995, following the closure of Ape Incorporated and taking in much of its staff. The company is responsible for a variety of things, such as creating the 3D models of Pokémon and even with developing some games of their own. Nintendo, Game Freak and Creatures each own a share of the franchise, and to easily manage the various Pokémon centers around Japan and expand the Pokémon brand, they created the Pokémon Center Company, though now it's just called the Pokémon Company. But enough of the legal bollocks, nobody gives a toss about that. For the sake of clarity and accessibility, most of the footage for now will be from the English releases of Red and Blue. These weren't just straight localizations, but all releases of Red, Green and Blue are nearly identical in terms of mechanics and story. Now would be a good time to explain the differences. As mentioned previously, the initial releases were Red and Green versions in February of 1996. In Japan, Blue version was released later alongside an issue of the Koro Koro magazine in October. It came with new sprites and fixed some bugs, and this Blue version was used as the basis for both Western Blue and Western Red. 
Yeah, exactly. Green version never left Japan, with only Western Blue and Red being released in September of 1998 in America and in October of 1999 for us losers here in Europe, because of course. The sprites and basically everything else are the same as Japanese Blue, however the version exclusives were based on the Japanese Red and Green versions, because why not make this whole thing more confusing, am I right? However, Japanese Red and Green had a different layout for the Cerulean Cave, which was updated in Japanese Blue. Blue's layout is the one used in Western Red and Blue, which also switched the in-game traits back to Japanese Red and Greens, resulting in some interesting translation mistakes. All versions of Yellow, though, are basically the same, aside from the Western releases having Game Boy Color enhancements, while the Japanese version only supported them on the Super Game Boy. And with that I can finally start talking about the game itself, the thing that people care about. The game begins with an introduction to the world of Pokémon. Professor Oak talks about the many creatures who inhabit the world. Humans and Pokémon live together in peace, side by side. Some keep them as their pets, while some train them every day to become the very best, like no one ever was, and also to breathe fire and shoot laser beams. Professor Oak, however, instead studies Pokémon as his profession. You play as a young boy who lives in Pallet Town, located in the region of Kanto. You and your childhood rival, Professor Oak's grandson, are about to start your adventures as Pokémon trainers. Oh, what's this? A path covered in tall grass, where untamed Pokémon live and attack those who pass through? Well, I guess I'll just go and try to commit Pokémon-assisted suicide. Professor Oak stops you before you do anything too rash and tells you that you need your own Pokémon to protect yourself, so he brings you to his shack. You get to choose between three starters, Charmander, the fire-breathing wizard, Squirtle, the water-spewing turtle, or Bulbasaur, the... something. Now that you have your own pet, you can probably safely walk alone through the grass. But before you get to do any of that, your rifle challenges you to a trainer battle perfect for his first humiliation. Once you cross Route 1, you find yourself in Viridian City. Over at the Pokémart, the clerk asks you to deliver Oak's parcel to, well, Professor Oak. So off you go, backtracking to Pellet Town once more. The professor thanks you for being his unpaid delivery boy. Your rifle then shows up uninvited, which turns out to be quite convenient. The professor explains that he has dedicated all of his life to researching Pokémon, but he's getting old and thus doesn't have the possibility of spending all his day in the field. But lucky him, you and your rival are more than willing to join in on his child's wavery ring. He entrusts you with the Pokédex, a digital encyclopedia that records info on the Pokémon you catch, such as the fact that the Fire-type is responsible for global warming. And catching them all and completing the Pokédex is your ultimate goal. Sure, you might dismantle a criminal organization or two in the process, and you might become the world champion, but I mean, that's par for the course, right? So how does it all work? I'm sure that at least half of you already know, but it wouldn't make sense to not explain anything in this video. Battles involve one-on-one -on -one turn based combat between two Pokémon. The goal is as straightforward as it gets. Smack their asses! Every Pokémon has a base HP, attack, defense, speed and special stats, which influences the damage they can deal and take, as well as how fast they attack. By earning XP from battles or by consuming drugs, the Pokémon gain levels and their stats increase. Every Pokémon also has one or two types assigned to them, which of course also influences what moves are super effective or not very effective. At certain levels, Pokémon might also learn new moves, and they might also evolve, increasing their base stats and changing their typing in some cases. A select few Pokémon evolve through different methods, however, namely with items or with trading. Moves themselves have their own type, along with accuracy and power. Fire moves, for example, are effective against grass, bug and ice Pokémon, while fire Pokémon are weak against water, ground and rock moves. When a Pokémon uses a move with the same type as its own, it also gains 50% more power, commonly known as same type attack bonus. 
Normal flying ground rock ghost and bug moves are considered physical moves, and thus use the attack and defense stats to calculate their damage. Fire, water, grass, electric, ice and psychic are considered special moves, and thus use the special stat to calculate their damage. Yes, special moves get a single stat for both offense and defense, while physical moves have to take two into account. As you've probably guessed, I'm going to come back to this later. Moves can also be acquired by using technical machines and hidden machines, or TMs and HMs for short. TMs are single-use items that teach a specific move to a Pokémon. There are 50 of them, and for most there is only a single one available every playthrough, so you have to think about your choices. For the TMs that don't suck at least. Why is this a thing? HMs, on the other hand, can be used as many times as you want. There are 5 of them, and they have a secondary function essential to progressing further into the game. Surf lets you cross water, Strength lets you push boulders, Fly lets you quickly travel to cities, Cut lets you hurt nature, and Flash is Cancer. Unlike TMs, however, which function as regular moves, HM moves cannot be deleted. Surf is great and Strength and Fly aren't bad, but unfortunately Cut and Flash are garbage, so refrain from teaching them to your strongest Pokémon unless you want to cripple them. It wasn't until Generation 2 that the people of the Pokémon world found the cure for cancer. Every Pokémon can only learn up to 4 moves at once, and you can only carry up to 6 Pokémon in your party, so there's an element of decision making when it comes to party composition. The idea is that you can switch them out during your turn so you can have the type advantage and wreck your opponent's team as efficiently as possible. But how do you actually get Pokémon? Well, you give them a face full of balls. Pokeballs are the worst, Great Balls are better, Ultra Balls even better, and Master Balls never fail but you can only find one each playthrough. Normally at least. Just throw your balls at wild Pokémon, which are randomly encountered on caves, the sea and weeds. You can increase your chances of success by lowering their health or putting them to sleep or paralyzing them and making them cripples, but in the end it's all down to luck. If at first you don't succeed, try again. And then 20 more times because screw you, random number generator. But these are just the mechanics. What you actually do with them is up to you. This isn't like your average JRPG where the party composition depends on the story, with characters coming and going and having specific roles. True, there are JRPGs with customizable parties, with custom characters or similar, but most of them can't match the sheer amount of choices that monster taming games give the player, and Pokémon is a fine example of that. One player might try to find the strongest Pokémon available, another might play favorites, building a party solely composed of, say, birds. A third player might try to spread experience points evenly through a 6 Pokémon party, while a fourth player focuses on one or two. It's because of this freeform approach to party building that games of this kind are so replayable. Everything feels more personal because you decide what you want to do. Of course, this being Generation 1, I'm romanticizing it quite a bit, and implying that you have 151 possible party members would be quite disingenuous when a good portion of those are part of the same evolutionary line. This is one thing that was really helped by the mainline Pokémon series being iterative. Instead of resetting the whole thing, the games just keep adding more Pokémon and moves, and Jesus Christ, the amount of options you have in newer generations really blows Generation 1 out of the water. Man, imagine if Pokémon pulled a Telefang 2 and removed certain monsters in the latest generation. <laughs> God, that would be really stupid. I'm glad Game Freak would never do something ridiculous like that. Another part of your journey is the Chim Challenge. There are 8 Chims in total, each specialized in a certain type. Defeating the Chim leaders earns you badges that let you enter the Indigo Plateau, the final part of the league. In every gym, you have trainers and puzzles to clear before challenging the leader to a Pokémon battle, because cockfighting is how you go up in this society that we most definitely live in. Each badge also gives your Pokémon a stat boost in battles against AI trainers... or something? Honestly, I never understood the mechanics behind this supposed stat boost. 
It's never properly explained anywhere in the games, and it's just mentioned once when the team leaders give their badge. And I guess Game Freak eventually realized how unnecessary and misleading an invisible stat boost was because Glorious Generation 4 threw it out the window. Or maybe they didn't because Gen 3 replaced stat experience with a more obnoxious system. So basically, here's the thing. Pokémon start with zero stat experience in each of the five stats, and by defeating other Pokémon, the stat experience can increase by up to 65,535 points. This is why a Pokémon that you have been training the whole game seems much stronger than another Pokémon of the same species and same level that has been freshly caught. You also have individual values, which are randomly generated and range from 0 to 15. The higher each stat's individual value, the higher that stat will be. It's not a massive difference, but it's still there. Now here's the problem with these mechanics. There isn't a single line of dialogue or a stat screen in the entire game that explains this. And you know what? Feel free to completely ignore these mechanics. You don't need them to beat the game, and Game Freak knew that, which is probably why they are obfuscated. I played the games for years before learning about them, and nothing really changed. Anyway, you can also trade Pokémon with other people, both the pixel ones in-game and real-life ones. Traded Pokémon get extra experience points, but refuse to listen to your orders if your badges don't allow it. In towns and cities, you have access to various facilities. Pokémon centers let you heal your Pokémon or dump them in the cloud when you want to remove them from your party, because for some reason these living beings can be compressed into a tiny ball and turned into computer data. I don't get it. I thought they were supposed to be pocket monsters, not digital monsters. The Pokémarts are where you buy and sell items. You will also find normal houses full of normal people, but then you have places like the Game Corner where you can trade money for coins or earn them by playing games that underage kids shouldn't. The coins can then be exchanged for items and Pokémon. The game doesn't have a difficulty setting, but battle style might as well be one. Switch gives you supernatural powers, telling you what Pokémon your opponent will send out next, and giving you the option to switch your current one. Which is patently unfair to an AI that is already handicapped by its own stupidity. Set mode doesn't tell you anything and instantly brings out the next Pokémon, putting you on a level playing field with the AI. Not that this is enough to make the AI challenging in any way. But then again, I'm not a difficulty fetishist, so none of this stops me from enjoying these games. If you're like me, you enjoy discovering and training the Pokémon you find. If that's the case, then I think that Tachiri and his team fulfilled their objective. Maybe it doesn't have the story and mechanics of Megami Tensei, or the complex breeding and min-maxing of Dragon Quest monsters, but Pokémon still stands apart in the monster-taming subgenre. Nostalgia and familiarity plays a big role, of course, but there's something about the design of the Pokémon world that has always fascinated me. It's just so... welcoming and approachable, you know, and I really do like a lot of its monster designs. It's not like Megami Tensei, where spending enough time with it might turn you into a Satanist who worships a giant penis monster. Jokes aside, if you stumbled into this video while never having touched a Pokémon game, then give it a shot. You might just be surprised. But that's not to say that Red, Green and Blue are perfect. Being the first entries in a new franchise, it's only natural for there to be some problems. So buckle up and let's beat the crap out of this dead horse. For starters, while the games have a lot of options, it's no secret that racing your starter Pokémon alone will give you a much easier time than racing a whole team. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. Calling the AI stupid would be an understatement, but calling it intelligence anything is an insult to inanimate objects. The AI's main priority is picking a move of a type effective against your Pokémon, regardless of what the move actually does. It's bad enough that the AI trainers are stuck with Pokémon limited to the last four moves they would learn at their current levels. It's quite sad to see the final boss's Pokémon be sitting ducks because they are brainless zombies stuck with the most useless of moves. Why does Raiden have both Leer and Tail Whip? 
Why does Charizard have rage? Why in the unholy name of Arceus does Executor only have three moves? I've seen people claim that these games are harder than the baby tier casual fest that is every post-generation 1 game. If you ever meet one of those people, be sure to slap them through the face with these move sets. Maybe also tell them to suck on some rare candies until they learn how to use growth. These issues also manifest on the player's side. A good portion of the roster has an embarrassing set of level-up moves, and you can be considered lucky if you have two half-decent moves of your own type. Unless you're a bug type, in which case you can go screw yourself, because all three offensive bug moves are total garbage, in a similar situation are the Dragon and Ghost types, the latter of which there are only three Pokémon and they are all weak to Psychic. And speaking of special design decisions, everything involving the special stat is just... dumb. Not only are many of the best moves in the game part of a special type, but there's also no way to deliberately lower it. You can use white screen to have special damage for 5 turns, but there's only, like, 12 Pokémon that learn it. Combine that with Amnesia, a move that raises the user's special stat by two whole stages, and the fact that you only have special instead of special attack and special defense, and yeah, you can see how there's a bit of a bias towards the special side of the spectrum. This is one of the reasons why the Psychic type is such a predominant point when people talk about Generation 1's mechanics, and Game Freak realized that because they worked their asses off trying to nerf it in Generation 2. Psychic is immune to Ghost, and its only weakness is Bug, which, you know, is friggin' useless. And due to the Psychic type's dominance, being weak to it is kind of a crippling flaw. Now let's talk about HMs. Awful, annoying, disgusting, dumb, irritating HMs. People hate these things, and with good reason. You are forced to use them to progress in the game, but they can't be removed and two of them are absolute garbage in combat. Cut will force you to turn back, Flash isn't strictly required but helps if you're not an autist who knows Rock Tunnel like the back of his palm, Fly is convenient, Strength is cut part 2 HM Boogaloo, and Surf is actually pretty good all around. Not only does this force the player to use specific Pokémon, removing some freedom from the gameplay, but the move Deleter wasn't added until Generation 2. So because they are permanent, you wouldn't want to cripple your main fighting force with something like Cut or Flash. Sure, Surf is great and Strength and Fly are okay, but if you don't want them on your strongest Pokémon, what are you supposed to do? Sacrifice one or two party swaps with an HM Slave? That's... Friggin' stupid. I also can't help but be frustrated by the fact that TMs can only be used once when practically all of them can only be found once per playthrough. Yeah, I understand. You are supposed to think carefully about these things, since so many Pokémon have such piss poor learn sets that they need to be taught moves from TMs to have any degree of variety besides maybe all one of their half decent moves. But at the same time, this isn't a game that ends after the credits. You're not meant to start a new game once you beat the champion, you're supposed to continue working on the same save file, trying to complete the Pokédex and building a team of highly competitive Pokémon so that you can beat all your friends and show them how much of a badass you are. Oh, but what do I even know? It's not like there was a series of partner games focused entirely on competitive battling that incentivized you to make your team as powerful as possible in order to beat the brutally hard round 2 championships and to not have to use the rental Pokémon because their movesets were deliberately gimped and made worse than their previous evolutions. Now I want to talk about the big fat elephant in the room. There are multiple versions, but I'm talking about them like there's only one. Yeah, we've all been stockholmed into accepting this as the norm, I know. The only difference between the western red and blue versions is that you can find a few exclusive wild Pokémon in each version, so you have to trade them from the other version. You could say that this is following up on Tachiri's idea of two friends trading Pokémon and battling each other, but I guess I'm just a bit too cynical to accept that as anything but a business decision. You visit the same places, find the same items, and fight the same trainers. Game Freak could have easily added some post-credits area with the other versions exclusives, but no, screw you, trade only. 
The split also assumes that the player will have the chance to actually, you know, trade. I'm sure the situation is different in Japan, but friend is a bit of a rare commodity over here, and almost all of the trading I did was with myself. In Stadium. This means that getting Pokemon who won we have off by trading is kind of a pain in the ass. And you know what the best kick in the balls is? Japanese Blue had two in-game trades that would get you a Hunter and a Graveler, which would then evolve. These were changed in Western Red and Blue. And don't get me started on all the weird bugs and oddities, which are actually pretty interesting in their own way, but still. Some of these initial problems would get improved in September of 1998. The next and final game from Generation 1, Pokemon Yellow Version Special Pikachu Edition, is once again an updated version of the previous releases. Unlike Blue and English Red, however, it is actually a decent improvement, and not just because the new front sprites don't look quite as off model nowadays. The story and progression are practically the same, but instead of picking from the three starters, you get a special snowflake Pikachu that hates your balls and has an actual voice, instead of the usual cry. It also follows you around and reacts differently depending on a variety of factors, a lot like the system that was implemented in Heart Gold and Soul Silver and greatly expanded in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. Sometimes it will be happy, sometimes it will be scared, and sometimes it will absolutely hate your guts because you want to evolve the stupid thing but it refuses to let thunderstones do their job, goddamn I'm dumping you alone in a box you annoying little shit. This particular version also takes inspiration from the Pokemon anime. Your Pikachu's refusal to evolve is much like Ash's own, and certain characters like Officer Chenny and Nurse Choi show up as NPCs. Even Chessie and James show up to get in your way. But the real highlight is that the entire game has been rebalanced, generally for the better. Pokemon movesets received some changes, and important battles tend to be harder and force you to think just that little bit more about your party composition. Even the AI doesn't seem quite as special as it used to be. It's still Gen 1, but it doesn't feel like it's going to fall apart and tear open a hole in reality if you so much as dip your toes in the waters of Cinnabar. What is this, Chernobyl? As a practical example, take the first gym. Brock uses two Pokémon with high defense and resistance to normal moves, a very common type early on. Unfortunately for him, Squirtle wrecks his ass with Bobo, Bulbasaur wrecks his ass with Vine Whip, and Charmander might have a type disadvantage, but Brock's Pokémon have such a low special stat that Ember still burns right through them. Meanwhile, in Yellow Version, you're incentivized to not rely only on your starter because Pikachu is completely friggin' useless here. Thankfully, big brain boys will catch themselves a Mankey, which learns Low Kick very early, or a Nidoran male, whose burn set has been altered to learn Double Kick much earlier. So while it's still the same game at its core, it's also a more well-rounded revision as a whole. If for some convoluted reason you could only play one of these, I would recommend Yellow. But leaving aside everything about the game's balancing and content, I do have to say that I don't have as much of an attachment to Yellow as I have to Red and Blue. Which is weird because, to me personally, Yellow is one of the most important games ever made. I'm not sure if it was my very first video game, but it was certainly one of the first few. At the very least, it was the one that got me started on Pokemon and likely made my tastes in video games into what they are nowadays. I eventually got both Red and Blue, but Yellow was the first for me. I got the game along with my good old purple Game Boy, which unfortunately has long lost its color and is now a weird black abomination. I haven't touched it in a very, very long time, because the buttons have worn out so much that it can't register any input unless I... finagle with it really hard. I don't like getting overly attached to things that I don't need anymore, but as I grow older and my interests evolve, I find myself regretting not giving my old systems the care they deserved. You know how some people keep diaries and then see themselves reading what their past selves thought many years ago? I guess old video games are a bit like that. 
Those old save files are kind of a window to the past, as silly as I'm probably sounding right now. Together with Pokemon Stadium's Chibi Tower and Box functions, a considerable amount of my lifespan was contained in the many playthroughs I had of these games. All of my favorite Pokemon from those times are stuck there forever and I will never play with them again. But enough of the gloomy thoughts. I wanted to show a bit more of Pokemon Stadium here, even if it was just an awkward off-screen recording, but I have no idea where exactly my Nintendo 64 is. I know it's here. Somewhere. But after spending half an hour walking through random boxes, I couldn't find it. So with that, I guess I've covered Generation 1. Now we jump over to Generation 3, in which Red and Green were brought back from the ashes, facing a new audience that had never traveled through Kanto. Released worldwide in 2004, Fire Red and Leaf Green are complete remakes that take Ruby and Sapphire as a base and bring the mechanics and visuals up to Generation 3 standards. The journey remains mostly the same. You still have to challenge the team leaders and you still have to catch them all. Everything else has been updated with all the quality of life features, Pokemon and autistic min-maxing mechanics that have since been implemented. I'll talk about them in detail once I cover Generations 2 and 3, but here's a brief introduction. There are now 386 Pokemon in total, with new evolutionary stages for some of the original 151. The Psychic type got kicked in the balls with the new Dark and Steel types, and the separation of Special into Special Attack and Special Defense. Many new moves have been added, greatly increasing your options. You will also be dealing with two new battle mechanics. First is Natures, which are randomly generated and can either do... absolutely nothing, or can raise one stat by 10% and lower another by 10%. The second is abilities, granting passive bonuses such as nullifying certain moves or causing status effects if the opponent makes contact, because moves are now categorized as either contact or indirect moves. All of these changes make the game significantly more balanced and challenging. I wouldn't call it hard, but at least the difficulty doesn't sabotage itself this time. And if nothing else works, you can always grind harder with the VS Seeker, which lets you rebattle trainers. To complement the improved battle mechanics, you have breeding. Slap two Pokémon in the daycare and they might just make an egg. There isn't any crossbreeding in the vein of Dragon Quest monsters here though. The baby will inherit the species of the female and the egg moves of the male. One completely new addition is the Savvy Islands. After the Cinnabar Gym, Bill shows up and forces you to come with him to one island in order to help a friend of his. Once you finish that little quest, you're free to go to the first three islands at any time. There are more, but those are unlocked further into the game. In these islands, you can find some of the now standard facilities that weren't present in the original games. These include the full daycare, where breeding is possible, and the trainer tower, for people who hate themselves. The Sefi Islands have their own questline too, involving the search for a couple of pebbles, some dungeons and Team Rocket doing its thing again. While it's very short and some of the islands are incredibly small, it still adds some extra flavor to the world and helps the region feel more connected to Johto and Hoenn. For some reason, the Sefi Islands also feature music from the Johto region. I have no idea why, but I do know that they are really good remixes. Could it be a hint that there were plans for Johto remakes in Gen 3? Are the Sefi Islands part of Johto? Was it just a little reference? I guess we'll never know. And really, the rest of the music is mostly pretty friggin' good too. While Ruby and Sapphire went with... An attempt at orchestrated music, Fire Red and Leaf Green take an approach that matches the GBA's crunchy sound way better than trumpets and brasses. In fact, their version of the Kanto Champion theme is still my absolute favorite. Unfortunately, Generation 3 comes with its own baggage. I mentioned how Game Freak replaced that experience with a more obnoxious system, and that is Effort Values, or EVs for short. Every individual Pokémon can earn up to 512 EVs by defeating other Pokémon. 
each individual stat can only get up to 256, so you have to divide those 512 EVs through the Pokémon's various stats. This is actually a really good idea, enhancing the variety in builds for competitive play. Combined with natures, this means that dedicated players can min-max their Pokémon to their heart's content, and enhance the strategies that fit their playstyle. But I said that this was obnoxious, and that's because, just like stat experience, the games don't tell you anything at all. Probably because Game Freak once again realized that this mechanic is 100% tedious. At least with stat experience, you didn't have to worry about crippling your Pokémon. With these new mechanics, your Pokémon is constantly earning EVs from the moment it starts battling. And because each individual Pokémon grants a different amount of EVs, the game doesn't tell you how many you have, and the only way to remove EVs is to use some berries that are kind of annoying to get, well, yeah, you can see why I'm not too fond of this crap. EV training is the worst kind of chore, and it baffles me that Game Freak has since made these mechanics easier to manage, but still refuses to give you the exact values. Besides that, Fire Red and Leaf Green also have a couple of things that should have been handled better. One of these is the National Dex, which lets you record information on Pokémon not present in Kanto's regional Dex. Without it, you can't get certain post-generation 1 evolutions, such as Crobat. And of course, you only get it once you cleared a Pokémon League and finished almost the entire game. This is mostly an aesthetic thing, but Ruby and Sapphire might as well not even have a day and night system. Fire Red and Leaf Green go one step further and straight up remove any time functionality, which is a disappointment now that Game Freak had more advanced hardware. I also hate how slow the battles are. The text takes too much time to advance, and there are several unnecessary animations that you can't turn off. God bless emulators. If I sound kind of frustrated with these remakes, you're imagining things. It's just that there isn't much to say about the best parts without going into the nitty-gritty of the improved mechanics, and explaining how Wing Attack having 60 base power instead of 35 has shaken the foundations of the world to its very core. It's Ruby and Sapphire, but Encanto doesn't exactly make for a compelling script, you see. The Choto and Hoenn remakes are a lot more interesting to talk about, but that will have to wait. Regardless, they are still an upgrade in most ways, and as far as official stuff goes, they are the definitive way of playing through Kanto. More recently, in November of 2018, Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee were released. These are some sort of pseudo-remake sequel whatever of the Kanto games, now in full with 3D and with a whole lot of weird changes. Which I'm not going to cover in detail for a couple of reasons, mainly the fact that I don't have a Switch, and Yuzu isn't anywhere near ready for prime time. If you want my preliminary thoughts, I think that Let's Go is... fine? I mean, I don't like some of the changes, and it seems like a step backwards from Sun and Moon, but they aren't mainline titles, so uh, whatever. I really like the expanded interaction with your starter, and the ability to ride your Pokémon. It really helps connect with your team as actually being your partners, rather than just annoying little cunts like Pikachu in Yellow version. And it's certainly cool seeing Kanto in 3D. On the other hand, Wild Battles got replaced with Pokémon GO's catching system. Not that Smack Animal Throw Balls sounds particularly exciting, but at least you had to fight for it. Now you will catch basically everything, just because half of the experience points you get still come from wild Pokémon. Wild Pokémon now show up on the overworld too. Personally, I'm a stubborn asshole who hates change, but the system does have its advantages, and I can see why some people love it. However, the maps themselves are still pretty tight, and all the Pokémon just get awkwardly bundled together in one area. This is related to something that really bothers me about Let's Go and the Generation 6 games, and that is the map design. The games evolved to full 3D, yet many of the map layouts still use a grid-based system. Supposedly, this is because Let's Go was being developed at the same time as Sun and Moon, and they couldn't just reboot everything from scratch on the updated engine. Either way, it's a downgrade. The Zevi Islands aren't present too, which seems like a missed opportunity. 
Together with the removal of a lot of moves, and every Pokémon except Chen Wants and this Nutter over here, I'm not sure what the idea was. Supposedly, the goal was to appeal to the Go audience and ease them into the mainline series, but I don't know. Pokémon isn't hard to get into. It has a ton of creatures, moves and items, but you don't need to know everything in detail to progress. In fact, the most complicated mechanics are obfuscated because ignorance is bliss. Recent games are a bit more open about them, but you can still ignore breeding and whatnot if you want to. I feel like the new audience will just end up getting the wrong idea. From an aesthetic standpoint, uh, it looks okay, I guess? It certainly is more technologically advanced, but certain areas like the Viridian Forest have that post-processing vomit kind of feel. And honestly, I prefer the visual style used in the 3DS games. Still better than Swooshy, though. Given the how fast mix between mainline and mobile mechanics, I'm not entirely sure who these games are targeted at. But then again, it seems like they ended up selling like hotcakes, so what do I know? Regardless, I won't tell you that the original games are better than their GBA remakes, because they aren't. But I will tell you that they are still worth playing. Yeah, they are outdated when you have ROM hacks and remakes, but there are still plenty of reasons to play them. Like historical reasons. Or because Game Boy aesthetics are awesome. Or like having fun. That's a decent excuse, I think. And besides, if you never play them, you can't see just how far the franchise has really come. You don't even need a working Game Boy and cart if you don't want to emulate. The games got ported to the 3DS Virtual Console, and you even get updated trading and battling functionality. The games use wireless connectivity, and the best part is that you can send your Pokémon to the Pokémon Bank service, and then to Gen 7. Kinda blows my mind after Gen 3 killed backwards compatibility. To clarify, these versions don't have online trading, they simply have a substitute for the link cable. If only they could port the Stadium games to the Switch with updated functionality. Now that would be a perfect idea. Makes sense that it will never happen. Though with emulation, you do get easy access to excellent ROM hacks that make the games extra awesome. To be quite honest, I haven't played the vanilla games in a long time. Instead, I played ROM hacks like Red++ Plus Plus to death because they add so much good stuff while still keeping the classic atmosphere of the Game Boy games, and I think that's why it's my favorite way of journeying through Kanto. As much as I like Fire Red and Leaf Green, I can also appreciate a modernized Generation 1 that keeps part of its simplicity. And if you've watched some of my videos before, you know that I absolutely love this kind of top-down aesthetic that can only be seen on the Game Boy and Game Boy Color. And if you just want the vanilla experience with a facelift, note that there is a colorization hack with optional Generation 2 sprites. Or you can just use the Super Game Boys and Game Boy Color's alternative palettes, I guess. The inverted one is pretty cool. The point I want to segue into is that the early days of long-running franchises tend to have this unique appeal to them. They have the kind of weirdness that you would never see in a modern entry, and I don't mean the autistic kids with an obsession for shorts, or this asshole who challenges you because he thinks you're about to vomit. Oh yeah, and the human turns himself into a Pokémon, what the fu- But what about the sprites? More specifically, the front and back sprites. In this day and age, they look pretty weird, don't they? Mankey is a tentacle monster, Coughing is upside down, Gastly is a fart cloud with a face, Golbat has mental problems. Oh yeah, remember when Pikachu was fat? Oh wait, it's fat again. The weird-looking sprites just add to this arbitrary and highly subjective bollocks called charm. Or soul, if you want to keep up on the latest memes. Sure, they walk off model today, but keep in mind that they were adaptations for a tiny screen, done in a different style from later games. Just look at the scrapped Capumon designs. Generation 1 sprites don't look so weird now, do they? Aside from a few stinkers, they sure as hell don't look bad, especially the updated blue and yellow sprites. There were definitely some talented people working on these. Similarly, the glitches are just part of the charm. People who played Generation 1 might be familiar with the Miss Signal glitch. 
The easiest way to trigger it is to watch the old man's tutorial and then surfing along the coast of Cinnabar. Doing so would make a wild mess of pixels show up, along with giving you ridiculous amounts of whatever item was in your inventory's sixth slot. What could this mysterious creature be? Look, its type is bird. Maybe we discovered some super secret Pokémon. I wonder if it's connected to the Pokégods. Man oh man, I can't wait to get a Peekaboo. Yeah, if you were a little kid back then, then this sort of stupidity might have seemed vaguely possible. In reality, Miss Signal was just the result of this strip of water not having any encounters programmed into it. And the Pokégods? All made up stuff born from baseless rumors and little bits of information of the sequels, mixed with a bit of malice, of course. And I guess that this charm is part of what makes the Generation 1 games still be so meaningful to me. It doesn't make them objectively good games, in fact, it does the exact opposite. I'm not the kind of guy who makes silly reaction videos and screams can't tell, but when I sit down and take another journey through the Pokemon world, objectivity goes out the window. I look at people bickering over their favorite generation with disgust. Chan Wonders, Joe Toddlers, Hoenn Babies, Sinnoh Fetuses, you know for abortions, Calosperms, whatever the term is for Alola. It's so tiring. And friggin' stupid. Yeah, I like some generations better than others, but I like all of them in their own unique way. And while I do burn with the rage of a thousand suns when I see some of the decisions made for Swooshy, I still want to play it one day. Not because it will be good or bad, or because it will be the holy grail of video games or the biggest bundle of garbage ever produced by our unholy existence. No, I want to play it because it's Pokémon. Generation 1 might be a broken, messy and unpolished pile of dicks, but I love these dicks nonetheless. <laughs>